At the stroke of midnight, the battle for the streets and the soul of Hong Kong was set to kick off. Umbrellas versus police batons, shields and tear gas. The joust of democracy versus autocracy. Hong Kong has become the iconic battlefield. 30 years after Tiananmen Square, these were images that Hong Kong never thought it would have to witness itself. The whole day had been such an affront to the face of the government here and the government in Beijing. The police moved in, thousands of them, locking horns with an equal number of protesters. Prosperity and stability of Hong Kong. It was all meant to be so different. Today, the territory's stern-faced chief executive, Carrie Lam, cracking a rare smile and sipping bubbly. To celebrate 22 years since Britain handed Hong Kong back to the People's Republic of China. This is supposed to be a reassuringly dull piece of post-colonial pageantry, and it was, until opposition politician Helena Wong started heckling Carrie Lam and had to be frog-marched from the premises. And so to the storm that started brewing from the morning. The flypast of the two flags of China and Hong Kong greeted like never before with the phalanx of middle fingers an interlude from the drama to come. The protest business of the day was nothing short of storming LegCo, Hong Kong's partially democratic mini-parliament. This has never happened before. It's a direct challenge to the authority of China on one of its most sacred patriotic days. And it's the kind of violent action that allows the authorities here and in Beijing to brand the demonstrators as hooligans or worse. The buttering ram is rudimentary, almost medieval, but the anger expressed here is primal and the organization is Hong Kong at its most efficient, just not the way you're used to it. I think uh, this is going to go on for a, a real long time if the government does not withdraw the bill completely and does not express or have any actual plan to rebuild the communication between the people and its regime. An antique dismantling the gates of government. Images like this are keeping Beijing up at night with an acute dilemma to crack down or let steam off. The police today were restrained compared to a few weeks ago. Pepper spray but no rubber bullets. It was a fine balance and it was on a knife edge. While thousands were busy storming LegCo today, hundreds of thousands marched peacefully against the controversial extradition law, against the lack of democracy, against Beijing. If you stifle democracy at the polls, it spills onto the streets. That is the lesson of Hong Kong. Night has now fallen, and so has LegCo. The alarm has gone off and it can be heard all the way in Beijing. The assembly occupied, the writing on the wall, on so many walls. The chamber itself stormed and vandalized. <laughs> Graffiti on the tables of pro-Beijing legislators. The emblem of Hong Kong defiled. In the mayhem, a glimpse of the Union Jack, not because of colonial nostalgia, but because they want London to speak up more for the democracy it pledged by treaty to support. There is no evidence that any of this has been stirred up by outsiders, but Beijing today put the world on notice and singled out Britain. Hong Kong affairs are purely China's internal affairs. No foreign country has the right to intervene. Britain has been arbitrarily interfering with Hong Kong affairs repeatedly. We have expressed strong dissatisfaction and resolute opposition to that. We advise the British side to stop interfering in Hong Kong affairs in any way. The other response today came in the form of a training video on Chinese state television 
of the People's Liberation Army on maneuvers in Hong Kong. A glimpse of the future or a not so subtle deterrent. After today, who can be so sure? In the last hour, Lejko has been cleared. The police have asserted their control. But the long-running battle for democracy here is far from over. Hong Kong means fragrant harbor in Cantonese. Tonight, this place was pungent with foreboding. Matt Fry reporting. Well, now, just before we came on air, I spoke to the pro-democracy legislator, Claudia Mo. I began by asking her if she thought this was the last chance to protect Hong Kong from what goes on in mainland China. This uh, fight against uh, this China extradition bill uh, has been seen by many as our last chance. And uh, with the fact that it's uh, being suspended, it's not good enough to most people, particularly the young. And so uh, that, that's why uh, the, the, the young snap. Uh, you have to understand the, the bottled up anger and resentment all these years, their hostility in particular at this legislature, because uh, it's just a rubber stamp body, basically, because Democrats are, out, are being outnumbered by all those Beijing stooges. This was, a, as you point out, a young people's demonstration, um, so that yeah. people like you from the legislature, etc., were not actually in this protest. Where were you? Because you were actually tear gassed yourself. Uh, earlier, I was uh, trying to urge uh, one of the apparent uh, leaders of the more militant uh, young protesters not to storm the legislature building because uh, I said that uh, it's very dangerous. Uh, they could charge you with rioting, which uh, carries uh, a maximum sentence of 10 years. You, you have to think twice. And uh, the reply I got was uh, that, that, that Ms. Mo, don't worry. I know you care, but uh, don't worry about us. Uh, the government has pushed us to this. Uh, it's been a tipping point that you have to understand and so on and so forth. Hong Kong legislator Claudia Mo. Now joining me from Westminster is the chair of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee, Conservative MP Tom Tugendhat. Tom Tugendhat, where now the agreement with China, which is supposed to last two systems, as it were, one system, but two uh, different uh, setups. I mean, that's supposed to last to 2047. It's dead? Well, we published a report as the Foreign Affairs Committee recently saying it's not one country, two systems anymore, but it's really one country, one and a half systems. And I think what we're seeing uh, at the moment, sadly, is evidence of that. And that's, that's a great concern, uh, not just uh, for the UK, which, of course, has uh, a legal obligation under the UN uh, registered treaty that we signed with uh, the People's Republic of China in 1997 uh, to uh, support the basic law, as it was called, as the constitutional document is called. But it's also a concern because Hong Kong is one of the major and most important financial centres of the world, and of course that uh, finance is underwritten uh, by the rule of law. And what one's seeing at the moment does call into question whether or not it is possible uh, to divorce civil rights from property rights and uh, this is a matter of huge concern because I'm not sure it is possible and therefore the UK may find itself uh, unable uh, to send judges to guarantee the uh, independence of the Hong Kong court system. And doesn't it go even wider than that? I mean, isn't Britain, let's be candid, completely powerless to do anything about this? Well, I, th I think that's, uh, in, in, in physical terms, if you like, that's absolutely right. In, in, in moral terms, I think that uh, we, the common law jurisdictions, which do send uh, judges to the uh, Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong, so that's uh, the UK, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, will have to look very carefully at uh, the decision that is being uh, taken to continue to uh, send judges if uh, the laws that they are being asked to interpret or to apply are not those that would be consistent with the common law jurisdiction. But isn't this a, a kind of marker for humanity to recognise that perhaps the great future is in fact state-run capitalism and, and that the freedom of the individual is, is at stake? Well, President Xi is experimenting, as many before him have, with a branch of Leninism 
uh, that has failed uh, consistently around the world and the very fact that he's decided to abandon term limits for the presidency and gone to uh, an eternal presidency to a uh, does call into question whether or not uh, he truly believes that the transition of power within a Chinese system is possible through peaceful manner, which does call into question the stability of the Chinese regime uh, itself. Now, I know that's not a, an original uh, idea, and it's certainly not a new idea, and people have been speaking about it for many, many years now. Uh, but it does, uh, when one's looking at the uh, incidents that one sees in uh, Hong Kong today, call really into question whether or not um, free markets are possible in uh, modern China. How worried should we be about, or should Britain be, about what happens next in, in Hong Kong? Well, I, I, I'm not sure it's just Britain. I think the whole world should be very concerned about this because uh, the fundamental underpinning of uh, peace and uh, the uh, prosperity of the last 70 years has been the application of law to international trade. And one of these uh, one of the applications has been through finance that has been cleared in places like Hong Kong and Singapore and so on around the world. And if that is being undermined, then that's a matter of great concern. Now, of course, we've got to wait and see. China does have a right, of course, to uh, make sure that uh, its borders are secure and that it has the influence that it didn't have, certainly in the earlier parts of the last seven decades. But seeking to uh, strong-arm Hong Kong is clearly not working and it may be a moment for pause rather than uh, for ramping up uh, any pressure on the LegCo or indeed on the people of Hong Kong. So perhaps LegCo should think about its decisions.